Hello, everybody. Randy Patterson here with Boomerosity. You know, you can't listen to classic rock without listening or hearing Blue Oyster Cult somewhere along the way. And boy, what a impression that band has made on the soundtrack of our youth. I mean, got to have, you know, Fear the Reaper. You had Saturday Night Live and Will Ferrell doing, you know, <laughs> the song is saying more cowbell. But, uh, you know, it just goes to show you how big of an impact Blue Oyster Cult has had on us as individuals, on society, and on the music of our youth, as I already said. Well, as you may recall, I've interviewed co-founder Joe Bouchard a, a couple of times a few years ago. And uh, now I get to interview his brother, Albert, who has come out with a new solo album uh, called uh, Mutant Transformation. And it's the third in the trilogy of the, the Imagining Trilogy, which is kind of a uh, a novel, uh, music for a novel, so to speak. And so um, as musicians always do, they bring in their friends and, you know, Albert certainly has done that. And he's uh, he's got his band, The Dictators, on here. It's great music. Absolutely great music. So if you're a Blue Oyster Cult fan and you just love that sound, you're going to like this album. You're going to love this album because it's it, it's kind of like Blue Oyster Cult, but completely different. Albert's got his own sound, and you're absolutely going to love it. So definitely get it if you don't have it already. Uh, please give this interview a listen. Please like the interview. Please subscribe to our channel or to the podcast channel or the, the our podcast, wherever you're listening to this podcast on. And please share it with your friends so they can enjoy it too and subscribe and like and that sort of thing, because that's kind of our lifeblood here. So without any further ado, I'm Randy Patterson with Boom Rossi with our first interview with the great Albert Prashard of Blue Oyster Cult. Until next time, take care. Hello, Albert. Oh, hey. How's it going? Pretty good. Pretty good. Hey, I love your background there. Where are you at? I'm at uh, the Welcome Center by the Thousand Islands Bridge. Okay, and that's in what state? Thousand it's Islands. New York. It's uh, ah, okay. on the border of Canada. Oh, my goodness. There's Canada, about a couple miles. But I see. Well, very yeah, good. well hey. I'm on the mainland. I have a, my parents have a, well, my family, my parents are gone now, but we have a cottage on this island over here and there's a bridge to it and uh, there's no, the internet is not very good there. So <laughs> I come over to the welcome center where they have a, okay, I shouldn't, I shouldn't put this out there, but I will, a free charging thing for your electric vehicle so oh wow very cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's cheaper joy. anyway you know than gas but uh yeah well, enjoy <laughs> that while you can right so yeah yeah exactly <laughs> exactly well man thanks so much for taking the time i know i've interviewed joe a couple of times so this is my first time to get to talk with you so it's a it's an honor and uh so thank you for taking the time to chat about your new release but before i ask you about it I was wanting to ask you how the um, – are you fully back from the the COVID shutdown stuff? Are you back to the new normal, or are you still getting in the groove of things, or how's that all working out for you? Uh, pretty much uh, it's over, you know, as far as I'm concerned. I, I got – I did get COVID. I think I might even got it a couple times, but uh, I had all the uh, the shots, so uh, it was really – not a big deal. I mean, I've had the flu before, and uh, it, I, so I get the flu shot every year. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the flu is no fun. But the COVID was it was pretty weak, you know. Uh, basically, a day of feeling bad, and then uh, then a week of a week or maybe two weeks of uh, my voice getting all, you know. Scrap, you know, I had the rock and roll voice for a couple of days there. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, cut some tracks, right? So. <laughs> yeah, 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 I did. I did. Believe me, on this new record, I I got one track uh, right in the middle of COVID. I think the third day after I had it. Yeah, yeah. I'm not concerned about really getting it. More concerned about spreading it. But 
you know, even that. It's I think we've turned the corner on this thing. Sounds so. like it. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully that'll be it for our lifetimes at least, you know. So yeah. So yeah. how's Joe doing? It's been a while since I talked to him. Is he doing okay? I think he's doing good. Yeah. He's uh he's got his own band now. Right. Uh, you know, he I played with him last year in uh, a band that we called the Bouchard Brothers. Right. And it was the two of us plus his girlfriend Joan. And uh, that was okay, but I remember at the time saying, uh, "Joe, I'm frustrated not playing with a drummer." You know, I, I, you know, I, I did a bunch of gigs with Blue Oyster Cult last year, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, and and Jules Rudina was the drummer, and I really enjoyed playing. And I have a solo band where Sizon Griffin is the is the drummer, and I really enjoy playing with the drummer. It's much more. It's to me, it's more work playing without a drummer because I'm so used to a certain level of precision, yeah. you know, parts. And, and when you play without a drummer, it's like, I felt like, I, you know, everybody liked the, the shows, but I felt it was not, I wasn't comfortable. Yeah. So well, you didn't uh, have that rhythm to fall back on. It's like trying, it's like, you know, trying to record without a click track or something, right? So. Yeah, yeah. So he's like, "Oh, we don't need a drummer," you know. But meanwhile, so, so uh, now he's got a drummer. He's got uh, Mickey Curry, who was a hell of a drummer. He's a great drummer. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, I, and I think he's happy with that, you know. So, not to say that I influenced his decision, but <laughs> <laughs> hey, what are brothers for, right? So. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. We still, you know, we still, we, uh, we've just finished a new Blue Coop record. So, uh, Very good. that's coming out. Yeah, pretty soon, I think. So, yeah, you know, if, uh, uh, did I hear correctly or did I dream this? If John Regan le recently left us, right? Did what? What was I thinking? Somebody, I thought John Regan was gone. No, no. Not that I know of. I haven't heard anything. Never about mind. That. I strike that from the record, Your Honor. I got that one wrong. So <laughs> I, I hope he's still around. He's I, I, I think he is young. too. So <laughs> I don't know what made that pop in my mind. It seemed like there was somebody recently that was tied to Blue Coop, and I I thought, but I you know what? I think it was. <laughs> this just shows my age. I you know I see something during the day, and I saw something on a Blue Cooper record that was in some of my stack of stuff, right? And I think I dreamed about it last night and I was thinking, wow, you know, we're getting up there and we're, you know, we're good. It's good to be alive. So I dreamed the opposite, oh. right? So oh, tell me, I, so I'm up here in the North country. I mean, I love it up here and we have, my family has this cottage over here and it's really, it's wonderful. My brother, Jimmy is here. So, uh, so we've been hanging out. I haven't seen him in two years, so it's oh, wow. really nice, wow. but, I'm really up here for my high school reunion, which was, uh, it was wonderful seeing, you know, this, uh, I guess it was about uh, 15 or 16 of us that were at the reunion. Huh? It's uh, my 50, 58th year since I graduated from high school. And, uh, you know, and I really loved it. And then that was the day before yesterday. And then yes, yesterday I woke up and I was depressed. I was like, there's more, there's more, uh, well, of the ma males, you know, the females, there's not too many that have died. There's only a couple, but uh, the males, you know, the, out of, uh, I think there was uh, 12 of us, and now there's only three. Wow. In my class. Wow. Three guys. Well, I went to my, it was an off year reunion. I grew up in Phoenix, and um, I went to mine last year and it was you know it was a multi-class reunion so we could have more yeah on that and it yeah it was sad to see how many people lost hey uh albert yeah. i i hate to say this i was i thought i was wrong but i was wrong we lost john back in april man oh wow yeah, back in april i'm sorry to be the one wow. to tell you that but it's it, i was my memory was right for a change and i i wish it wasn't um, wow. I think it was a cancer thing or something, if I remember right. But I just now looked it up and saw the beginning and the end dates. So, um, anyway, sorry about that. Man. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, hey, let's let's talk about brighter things and yes, new recording. Yes. Um, I yeah. love what I've heard, man. Mutant Reformation. Tell me the story behind it. 
Well, this was uh, this was something that uh, uh, go back to the beginning. We imagine Imaginers was this concept that Sandy Proman came up with. Right at the very beginning, before there was a blue oyster cult, before the soft droid down the belly, Sandy had this idea for this story. And he told me the story when I met him. And I thought, oh, that's cool. You know, I, this guy is really creative, you know. And But I didn't realize that it was going to be like songs. I thought it was going to be like this. He was going to write a novel or something, you know, or, you know, some short stories or something. But uh Shortly thereafter, you know, once we started writing songs together, and uh, I might like to add that uh, Buddha's Knee was the first song that we ever wrote together. Oh, wow. So, which is, which is the last song on this, la this final, you know, well, supposedly final uh, Imaginos record. Mm -hmm. So there was, so, but when we were, we were recording the initial uh, Imaginos record, we started it in 1982. Uh, after I was not no longer in Blue Oyster Cult, you know, before that, Sandy and I were trying our best to talk them into uh, recording this this group of songs that Sandy had written and and Joe and you know the the rest of the group. We'd worked on some of these songs, you know, Astronomy was one of them, and uh, the Blue Oyster Cult worked up a version of uh, I'm the one you warn me of and some of the others Del Rio song. And so uh, while we were recording, I said, so what, what happens after this? So, you know, imagine this is going to come out. It's going to be the, the big hit that we expect it'll, it'll be. So what are we going to follow it up with? And he said, well, it's going to be three records. It's going to be uh, bombs over Germany next. And uh, I said, so I guess it's going to have ME-262. And he, yeah, he said, it's going to trace the whole, the mirrors now uh, corrupted the Europeans and, and they're <coughs> they've got, they've gone all uh, narcissistic and, uh, and they're, they're trying to restore their countries to the former glory, et cetera, you know, and uh, so there's going to be all these wars. And I said, okay. And then what happens after that? You know, as it end, he goes, well, that's what half lifetime is all about. You know, the the last war where mankind destroys itself. I said, oh, okay. <coughs> what, what happens after that? How do we? How do we get another record out of? How this? do you follow goes, up oh, such that's... a feel good album like that? Right. So. <laughs> Yeah, right. Exactly. He said, well, it's going to be the mutant reformation. It's going to be, you know, life is going to regenerate itself, except not as we knew it, know it, you know. So uh, so that's that's how the idea of the of the three records came about. And, uh, you know, when what happened with Imaginus, when it when it came out and it was all this drama about, you know, that the record company didn't want to put it out. It's Al Bouchard record. So. Sandy talked them into it. He basically begged them and bribed them to uh, put their name on it. The Blue Oyster Cult put their name on it, and then it came out and it bombed as it as it was predictable, really, because uh, that was when Columbia Records decided that it was all about the single, and they didn't really give a crap about uh, an artist, you know, developing talent, you know, which is, you know, it's kind of turned around a little bit. The past few years but still you know there's still too much emphasis on you know that big hit that everybody wants you know and not enough of really on trying to have something unique and and uh and meaningful so yeah how long did it take you to to put this together this one took a couple of years i really took my time with it you know uh after the first one came out, you know, I was shocked that, you know, I made the charts, I made money. It was, it was sold really well. And so then I, I was, you know, I was ready, raring to go with the bombs over Germany. So that one we did relatively quickly, you know, uh, the first, first one reimagined us took a couple of years to do. Mm -hmm. And that bombs over Germany, I did it in less than a year, like 11 months between when, the one came out, uh, Reimaginos, and then Bombs Over Germany came out uh, 11 months later. So it was a pretty quick turnaround. And uh, and after that, I was like, okay, well, 
Sandy told me what he wanted on the re- on that record, but this record, the Mutant Reformation, I had no information. There was no, you know, there was no idea other than the title and you know the concept that you know that life, you know, reestablishes itself on Earth. So uh, so I had to kind of make things up. I wrote a few songs to tie the story together, and uh, and that was it. Was I mean I like doing a, a you know. My favorite thing when I'm writing a song is just to write something just for myself. You know, mm-hmm. I don't care who, you know, it's not trying to be a hit record. It's not trying to, I'm not writing it for any particular group. I'm just like doing some, you know, <laughs> it's, I, I, it's, I'm healing myself, you know, usually, yeah. Yeah. you know, some, something that's vexing me and I write a song and, you know, especially if it's a negative emotion, I can, you know, if, if the song is clever enough, I can just laugh about it later. So, um, <laughs> so, but, but, but I do like having an assignment to write a song. So this is my assignment to write this song. And uh, I found that I couldn't do it all by myself, that I had to reach out to other people. So that was great. Uh, I, I had about 30 people help me in it. Actually, more than 30 was, I think. 36 or 37 other musicians contributed to this record. Uh, I wrote, I co-wrote songs with uh, with Richie Castellano, Susie Lorraine. Uh, I guess me, basically those two. But uh, but uh, you know, it was really a great collaborative effort. It took a long time to get it all together. I got everybody that was everybody that's on the other records except for. Uh, uh, well, I had too many guitar players on this one. I, had, uh, <laughs> I didn't you know, know there I was got, such a thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there isn't. It's impossible. <laughs> but I did have Steve. I played with Robert Gordon for about six months before he died, and uh, and so I used the two guitar players that he used. I used on my record too. And the bass player that he used, I used on one song. Mm-hmm. So I got the them those guys to, to contribute, and then Ross, the boss, of course, had to, you know, he's he's always up for it, you know. So uh, and uh, so Ross, the boss, and then I had R.J. Ronquillo, and I also I I was learning a lot about playing guitar, so I I actually did a bunch of leads myself. I had Mike Fornatel. Mm-hmm. Do a do a lead with me on one of the songs, and he played rhythm on about a third of the songs. Oh, cool, cool. So I got Chasm Sultan to help me out. Oh yeah, Kaz. So, yeah, yeah I, I've interviewed him yeah. several years ago. Great guy. I I need him oh, again. I love him. I love him. He I love playing with him. He's a fantastic musician and just a great guy. Just a great guy. Respected yeah. by so many other greats, not just yourself, but you know, you know, you got Ron Green and oh, yeah. Then, yeah. yeah. Ringo, he plays with yeah. Ringo. So yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, I passed him. I was um first time I interviewed uh uh Steve Lukather was probably ten years ago, not no, eight or nine years ago. And he was going on the road with Ringo. He goes, "Hey, we're we're going to be stopping near where you're at. I'm I live in the Smoky Mountains." And he goes, "We're going to be in Greenville, South Carolina. Won't you come into the show?" I said, "Okay, cool." And you know, it was with Ringo and all that. I had no thought that I'd get to go backstage. But here I am. I'm walking around backstage with Luke. He goes, "Well, you want to meet the boss?" I was like, "Well, yeah, you know." And so we're walking down the hall, him and. Todd Rundgren and a couple others. And I found out later Kaz was in there and I, we hadn't, we didn't register with each other that we, you know, because of course back then it was all by phone. I hadn't started doing zoom. Sure enough, yeah, Luke yeah. took us back there and brought in Ringo soon after that. So I, for about five minutes, I got to bring this breathe the same air as a beetle, you know? So yeah. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Hey, what was what what surprises did you have in in working on this record? I mean, you've worked on so many. Were there any surprises on this one? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot. You know, I think. Uh, well, I I reconnected with Susie Lorraine, who is somebody that I've known since she was. Uh, I I met her when she just turned seventeen. So uh, uh, and we've known each other, and and you know, she is a music freak. She's always. You know, she she was a groupie for a while when she was young. Mm-hmm. You know, when I met her, she was a groupie. She was not my groupie. I want to 
point that out. I, uh, you know, I was married at the time and, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm not like that, you know, but, uh, she was, uh, but, uh, she was, re you know, she knew everybody. She, she knew Keith Moon, which I was so impressed, you know, you know, she, she was his girlfriend for a couple of weeks. So, uh, you know, on one life. tour, you know, yeah. <laughs> and she was friendly with him for, you know, until he passed. So, uh, you know, so, uh. Keith Moon was one one of my biggest influences. So anyway, I knew her because of that, and uh, we did go out for a while. And and uh, when I was first starting Imaginos, you know, she was she she became my girlfriend for a couple of years there, and uh, as in the beginning. And of course, she knew Sandy, and she knew the whole story. So when we uh, when we got together last year. She had a lot of opinions about, you know, some of these songs about, you know, Al, this doesn't work or, you know, this, this song's awkward, you know, and so uh, she really uh, was uh, very involved in the music and the lyrics and everything of this new version. So she was a big help for me. And, uh, and so that was, that was some of the things like we, she, there's a song called Martha and the Starfish and she's like, Al, this song doesn't make it. You should leave it off. You got plenty of songs, you know, and I'm like, but I like it, you know, and it's also, you know, it's about the mutants, you know, it's about the radiation, you know, and all of that, you know, and she's like, well, I, I get that you want to have it in the thing, but the music just doesn't make it, you know, and I didn't even write the song. It was written by Alan Lanier. So over, over six months, she was working on me to change it. So I did. And, and she's like, no, it still doesn't work. No, you know, and finally, when we got it right, uh, I, I put it on and, and I said, now, you know, maybe you should sing it. You know, I was singing at first because she sang a harmony to me. And I said, you know, that harmony is better than, than the melody. Why don't you sing your harmony? And I'll just, I'll come in and harmonize with you. So she sang it. I thought this is great. I had sent, I'd already sent an earlier version to R.J. Ronquillo in Nashville to have him put a guitar on it, and he he's like, "Oh, Albert, I'm I'm kind of busy. I'm doing these demos, blah blah blah." And you know, I had to go out and play with uh, what's his name from uh, Slipknot, uh, Corey. Uh, I don't know. He he does some gigs with this heavy metal band. So so he was he was kind of sandbagging me on it and then uh i sent him the version with susie singing it and two days later i have a lead that is i mean the whole song was so beautiful i was like i actually it brought tears to my eyes i thought this is so great you know that this song is has been fully realized for the first time ever so um yeah that was that was one of the best moments the, the other moment was uh, when uh, I would, I had written the song. Sandy Perlman wanted me to write a song called "Mountains of Madness," uh, based upon the H.P. Lovecraft story of the same name. Well, the story was called "At the Mountains of Madness." So I wrote a song, and Sandy didn't like it. He said, "Albert, no, this is not, this is not all, at all what I had in mind. I wanted like a horror." You know, it's like something scary or something like that. So, so I, I ended up not using that track and not, you know, thinking, well, I just don't know what to do. So, uh, while I was making the record, I, I said, oh, I get it. Maybe imagine us, he has to, because the whole idea was he was going to be redeemed. You know, Redeemed was originally about Imaginos. You know, if you, you know, I have a suitcase full of Sandy's lyrics. And uh, and you see each song that he wrote, there's probably 10 different versions in the suitcase. <laughs> and so you see how, you know, you know, instead of the dogs or Razzith Bear, it was going to be Imaginos. Mm -hmm. So... I knew he had to be relieved, and so he had to do something with the mirror because the mirror was a problem. It was causing all these wars and stuff. So, so I decided that the mirror would get thrown into the mountain of madness with all the Kalithu and all the and the elder ones. You know, the elder things, I guess, is how it's called in in the in the story. 
the H.P. Lovecraft story. So uh, I uh, I wrote a song, and I thought the. The, I like the idea of the song, but it is laying there like a turd. It's just, it's just doing nothing. It's just too, oh, too repetitious. It's too, I mean, repetition is good, but it was not exciting. So I, I uh, called up Richie Castellano and I said, Richie, can you help me with this? He sure. So you know, and we'd only written one song before, and that that song came out good, great. It was, came out very good. But how we did it, he came over to my apartment and we spent four hours on the lyrics and then 20 minutes on the demo. We just threw down the thing, you know, with, you know, and so I knew that it was going to be like that. So once again, instead of four hours, it was like two weeks we spent on the lyrics, you know, because we were doing it over Zoom, <laughs> you know, because we were both pretty busy. And uh, and I I was out on Long Island at the time, so... Uh, so we get the lyrics and we got it all. Now we've really got the lyrics pretty honed in pretty well, but we don't really have the music. And so I said, you know, so he said, well, I, how about this? You know, and I, ha I actually, we did it over FaceTime. So I have it all recorded, you know, and you know, how about this? And I'm like, geez, Rich, that's a, it's a lot of, a lot of chords. He goes, yeah, but you'll see it'll work. So. I work it up with a band and I send it to him. You know, we did a live version and uh, he goes, uh, I got a bit, I got another idea. Let me do a little demo for you, you know, before you go into the studio. I said, well, we're going in. He says, I can't do it right now, but you know, with sometime in the next two weeks, I said, but we're going to the studio this weekend. I, I, I have to have something. He goes, okay, well, I'll see what I can do. Uh, less than an hour later, I have a demo that is almost exactly like what's on the record. I'm like, holy crap, this is fantastic. So then I had to teach it to the band. And of course, there's still way too many chords. So they were like, oh, my God, Al, you're killing us here. <laughs> you know, we got we got these other five songs that are, you know, really tight, tight, tight. And then we've got this song where we don't know what we're doing. So well, I said, well, let's try it, you know. So we got to the studio. We did the other five songs in maybe three hours. You know, we, we knocked them out right away. I said, okay, let's try this Mountain of Madness song. And uh, we had to do like six or seven takes. But by the end, we had a, we had a take. It was all good, you know. And then, uh, then uh, Richie said, I said, Richie, you should sing it. Your demo is so good. You know, and he said, oh, are you sure it's your record? I said, no, I want you to sing it. So uh, I so he sat on that for a few weeks and then uh, then he wrote back and said, I can't top the demo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're going to have to use a demo vocal. I said, OK, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, yeah. He got he had like a moment, you know, where he was all, you know, he got, I'm sure he got manic and he was just like throwing down parts like crazy, you know? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So that was the other, other great moment, the mountain of madness moment where it, it, I just loved how it came all together. And then, then he said, I'll get Eric to do the narration in the middle, you know? Oh. So they did that in, uh, you know, in a hotel room somewhere in Pennsylvania, I think. <laughs> you know. Well, from the songs of this project, what, one would you point to and say as a calling card and say hey if you like this you're really going to love the rest of the record ah well i don't know i think i think flaming telepaths that's really what tells i had down that's what i was going to tell you mine was but i didn't want to put a bug in here that's exactly i wrote it down right here that that was my go-to song there so yeah yeah that kind of has it all i mean it's it's like blue oyster cult but it's different yeah yeah you know so i think that that tells the whole story you know it's you know i didn't really change it very much but it has enough of a of a difference that uh you can tell it's you know it's it's more modern and and it, it kind of fits in with the acoustic you know acoustic electric heavy you know yeah. heavy soft <laughs> all these uh opposites yeah uh, the, the contrasts work well, but um, so from those that have heard it so far, because you know it's still released yet. But um, for those who have heard it, you know, first of all, I love it. I think it's great. What's the feedback you're getting from others who? Have heard it? 
fantastic. It is number 16 last week in the Amazon physical sales chart. Mm -hmm. That's it for the whole United States. So, uh, you know, when you think about how many records are released, it's fantastic. This is doing better than, than the, and any of the others, mm -hmm. and it's doing better than any record I've ever put out. So good deal. This is this current record. So yeah, it's, it's pretty darn exciting. Oh, congratulations. I have to on tell that. You. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everybody is involved. It's like really excited. It's like, Oh my God, this is really working. So cool. Yeah. Is there going to be any That's kind of tour to support the record or are you just going to we, work it for We had a bunch of dates and we had to postpone them because the record company pushed the, the release date back a month. So now we're just doing uh, some promo. But yeah, I have four dates booked so far. And uh, uh, Sony Hall is uh, August 30th. Uh, then we have... Uh, the Rams Head in Annapolis, Maryland on the 2nd of September. And then on the 6th, we have Daryl's House in Pauling, New York. Right. And on the 7th, we have the Tally Ho in Leesburg, Virginia. Very cool. So, Well, I hope you get down so in my neck of the woods over in East Tennessee or even Nashville. I'll drive yeah. over to see you. But Yeah, I'm not sure that that's going to happen this year because right as soon as those gigs are done, I'm going to Spain with the dictators and doing another dictators tour we have 10 dates and then i have a recording session with a heavy metal group in uh in paris and then uh, then when i get back from that we're supposedly i don't know it's not confirmed at all so but uh, we've been uh, we've been invited to join the damned on their east coast tour from uh mid-october to uh, after thanksgiving so yeah so that's so, uh, but I'll be working on uh, touring next year with the solo, you know, doing this, doing more dates and, you know, trying to get a, like a proper tour where we do like 30 dates or something. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, either way, with it, who, regardless of who you're playing with, I'll keep an eye on it. And if you get within fitting distance of me, I'll, I'll swing over and... That would be great. Be I have to go, Randy. Uh, I've got another interview right okay. now. Okay, so. all right, my friend sign off but uh, it's been great talking to you and i look forward to doing it again sometime. likewise my door is always open to you albert take care and give my regards okay. to joe too please I all will. right thank you sir okay. take care thank you Bye -bye. this show was edited and produced by mike mcclellan the original music roll the dice was written and produced by quentin hope and randy patterson was your host and executive producer